In 2006, when he was just one month old, a little boy was found abandoned on the Cambodia-Thailand border. He had stage four HIV and a very serious tuberculosis infection. He was hospitalized and doctors and nurses fought to save his life. At that time in the developing world, only one in 40 children who needed treatment for HIV was receiving it, compared with one in eight adults. Doctors and nurses were not generally trained in pediatric HIV AIDS care and pediatric antiretrovirals were expensive. In the global fight against HIV AIDS, which had seen real progress for adults by 2006, children were being left behind. But that little boy, Basil, arrived in Cambodia at a time when the Clinton Health Access Initiative, partners, and the Cambodian government had just begun working together to expand access to pediatric treatment. In 2006, thanks to Unitaid donations that Chai used to procure pediatric antiretrovirals, Basil and thousands of other Cambodian children were able for the first time to receive the medicines they needed to stay alive. Basil gradually became healthier and stronger. At six months old, he moved to the New Hope for Cambodia Children Orphanage, where he still lives today. And this is where my father, later in 2006, had the privilege of meeting Basil for the first time and learning his story. You were so beautiful. That meeting with Basil continues to resonate with my father today. It's part of the reason why, when I was in Cambodia last year, I visited the New Hope for Cambodia Children Orphanage to spend time with Basil. He greeted me with an exuberant high five and showed me the classroom where he studies, the playground where he plays with cars and trucks, and the clinic where he gets his medicines. Medicines he knows are critical to his ability to lead a healthy and happy life. Stories like Basil's are the reason all of us, foundations, NGOs, governments, and individuals, do the work that we do, year after year, to bring care and treatment to children and adults living with HIV AIDS, and to work to once and for all bring an end to this crisis. Today, I am happy and healthy. I hope all the kids like me are happy too. So I can thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, President Bill Clinton. Thank you very much. Thank you and good afternoon. And I'd like to thank Basil. <laughs> I'd never seen that film before. I just saw it backstage, but he represents the millions of lives that are the real reasons we're all here. I would like to thank our conference co-chairs, Francoise Bure-Sanussi and Sharon Lewin, the city of Melbourne, and everyone who helped make this conference possible. I'd also like to thank the people who are really responsible for my presence here, the more than 1,000 men and women who do Chai's work around the world, the governments, foundations, and individuals who fund us, and I especially want to thank our host government, Australia, and the governments of Norway, Sweden, the United Kingdom, our first supporters, Canada and Ireland, Unitaid, the Gates Foundation, the Elton John Foundation, the Elma Philanthropies, Lifeball, and so many others. We've been there before.
Have you got the message? Give them a hand and ask them to let the rest of us talk. The last time I spoke here, I gave them a platform, and I was glad to do it. And I thanked them for letting me have one. I, uh, <clears throat> There's been a lot of understandable honor paid to the colleagues we lost in the airplane crash. I would like to begin by trying to put their lives into the context of this work and the larger struggle abroad in the world today. For good or ill, we live in the most interdependent age in human history. We are interdependent with each other and with our earthly home, and we cannot escape it. We're going into the future together, whether we like it or not. Therefore, I believe it is the job of every citizen, not just those of us here at this convention, to join the struggle which will define at least the next four decades, the struggle to define the terms of our interdependence. Will we build a future of shared prosperity, shared responsibility, and a shared sense of community, as everyone here is struggling to do? Or will we choose a different path? Now, I want to talk a little bit about what happened on that airplane as a reflection of this struggle. The loss of our colleagues and more than 290 others in what appears to have been a deliberate act is a stark reflection of the negative forces of our interdependence. People who don't want a future of inclusive economics, inclusive governance, inclusive communities. In 2003, Yoa Plung, when we were just beginning at Chai, helped us scale up AIDS treatment and care in Tanzania and South Africa. He continued to help us in the years since. He and the five other colleagues we lost lived lives which are overpowering in their contribution to a shared future. Those who shot them down and who provided the means to do so represent the other side in our struggle to define the terms of our interdependence. The open hand against the clenched fist. Inclusive politics and economics versus division and dominance cooperation against control, life against death. It matters not that the murder was meant to be committed against other people. I was very proud yesterday to be in this country when the Australian foreign minister spoke at the United Nations and overwhelmed by the comments of the Dutch foreign minister, who took my breath away when he speculated what the last moments of those people must have been like. In all the years that Chai has been working in difficult places around the world, we have lost only two employees in service, both were Dutch. A Dutch nurse who was shot in Lesotho 
almost certainly like this plane, a case of mistaken identity. And a Dutch nurse who went back and got a PhD to come home and run a lot of our operations in Tanzania, who died with her partner in the Al-Shahab killing spree in the Nairobi mall. They made their choice. So did the people who killed them. I hope that all of our countries who value freedom and honor will look at the statement made yesterday by the Dutch foreign minister before they give in to the temptation to say, well, maybe we should weaken our resolve to take a strong stand because after all, they didn't mean to shoot this plane down. It is important in this group that devotes its life to giving other people life, that we honor the service and the lives of those who were lost. And the promise of the children that was cut short by standing as the Dutch foreign minister stood yesterday in the United Nations, as the Australian foreign minister did, as our ambassador did. It is just the beginning of a long, complicated, highly various struggle to define the terms of our interdependence. We are here on this 20th anniversary of the conference to celebrate so much of progress that has been made because the world made the right decision to fight AIDS and now to create a generation free of it. We dare not walk away and all of us should lead the way. When we started working on the AIDS crisis back in 2002, Barely 100,000 people outside Latin America and the Caribbean were getting medication. There were still people seriously arguing that medicine would be too expensive and we should simply promote prevention. Now we celebrate a very different reality. Stepping up the pace is the perfect theme for this conference. For at this point, we are on a steady march to rid the world of AIDS. The theme says, good work has been done. And we have proven to others and to ourselves that an end to AIDS is possible. But the theme reminds us also that the achievements cannot be an excuse to slow down. This is called a conference, but I think we all know it's really a movement. That's why it's okay if somebody stands up and has their say. It's part of a movement to change the future. It's a call to constant action, to protect the lives and secure the basic human dignity all people deserve. Today, the most recent figures say that nearly 13 million people get the diagnosis, care, and treatment they deserve. I am honored that Chai has been able to work with many of you to negotiate prices with suppliers that have given now more than 8 million people in more than 70 countries access to low-cost HIV AIDS medicines. Thanks to Unitate funding, We've helped to reduce the price of pediatric ARVs by more than 80% to bring treatment to almost 650,000 children, about 75% of the world's total. We should no longer have any doubts, nor should anyone else, that we have the ability to see this effort through to the end. We're here <clears throat> because we know how far we still have to go. Every year, more than two million people are newly infected. About 
four people a minute. Every year, a million and a half people still die from AIDS-related illnesses, about three a minute. And despite the significant scale-up to nearly 13 million people, millions more <clears throat> still need access under the 2013 WHO guidelines. Implementing these new guidelines could prevent millions of new infections and AIDS-related deaths. How will we get there? By meeting the new UN AIDS 90-90-90 targets, 90% 90 of people living with HIV knowing their diagnosis, 90% of the people diagnosed positive receiving antiretroviral treatment, 90% of the people on treatment having an undetectable viral load by 2020. We should embrace these goals, all of us should. And we should determine, each of us in our own way, what we can best do to help achieve them. Our foundation is working with our partners to scale up treatment to everyone who needs it, to bridge the pediatric treatment gap, and to end mother-to-child transmission. An age-free generation is within our reach. We know treatment is the most effective tool we have to fight AIDS. New data from 51 countries suggests that 70 percent of HIV-related deaths could have been prevented if all these countries had had coverage rates as high as Botswana's. Those, of course, are due to its earlier response to what was then the highest infection rate in the world and to its strong health system. But we can all do better, both on quantity and quality of treatment. Finding and treating people earlier, before they become ill, ensuring that they receive the best diagnostic and medicines, providing treatment in new and innovative ways. The evidence continues to build that early treatment helps prevent further transmission of HIV, as well as allowing patients to live longer, healthier lives. Our next big challenge, therefore, is to find those people early, to ensure that positive people have access to the best drugs and diagnostics, we all know we've come a very long way on the drug side. Patients today have access to some of the best medicines in one pill once a day for 35 cents a day. In a high burden, limited resource country like Malawi, more patients accessing more effective and tolerable treatments improve outcomes and can reduce the overall burden on the health system. But when it comes to lab services, much work remains to be done. Only half of those infected with HIV know their status. Only a third of HIV-exposed infants are tested. Only a quarter of people on antiretrovirals have access to viral load tests, now recognized as the preferred monitoring tool. Thanks to our donors, CHI is working to accelerate scale-up of quality testing, including point-of-care technologies that bring services closer to the people who need them. For example, <clears throat> I think my favorite example, in Mozambique, Chai supported the government's vision for point-of-care diagnostics from introduction to scale-up, including expanding quality testing to rural and remote areas. We now have lab technicians in canoes on the lakes in Mozambique with point-of-care CD4 devices to increase ART initiation in rural communities and improve access to diagnostics. We're proud to be part of the Diagnostics Access Initiative being spearheaded by UNAIDS. This effort will help to expand lab services that we all need to meet our lofty goals. Recent advances in drugs and diagnostics give us the tools to make a tremendous difference. If you will, they are the bricks now we need the mortar, the support systems necessary to use the tools most effectively. Procurement of drugs, transportation for laboratory supplies, data management, essential to our response and also requiring streams of investment. Perhaps the most challenging part of improving quality will be delivering care to patients in a better way in rural and hard to reach areas. A number of governments and nonprofits are testing these methods to make it easier for those who need the care to get it. How can we reduce the distance they travel to the clinic? 
the time they wait, the money they spend to get there? How can we launch programs that ensure that they feel supported in their communities without the stigma that makes people still, after all these years, drop out of care? It is important to work with both local partners and donor governments. And I'm very grateful here in Melbourne for the government of Australia's continuing support of our efforts to answer these questions in Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, Vietnam, and as you saw, in Cambodia. Even though high-income countries are vital donors, I think I should take just a moment to acknowledge that we still have our challenges as well. Even though the United States has sent, seen an overall decrease in AIDS, in AIDS infections of about a third, the number of new infections among younger men who have sex with men has increased by 12%. And although our work is primarily focused in low-income countries, I try never to forget that HIV AIDS remains a high-income country problem, too. In addition to the work I mentioned, we're trying to help countries eliminate mother-to-child transmission and bridge the pediatric treatment gap. This is one of the most exciting goals in public health, entirely achievable with proper organization and relatively limited resources, but absolutely essential to achieving an AIDS-free generation. <clears throat> Thanks to Unitaid, as I said earlier, we're already helping to make real progress in pediatric ARV regimens. We've also helped to reduce the cost of testing instruments so that now more than a million children can be tested every year, up from just a handful a decade ago. Working with our partners in Cambodia, Ethiopia, Lesotho, Malawi, Tanzania, and Vietnam, we've been able to achieve an average 40% drop in transmission rates between HIV-positive mothers and their infants at six weeks in high-burden areas. But the job is far from done. 20,000 children are still infected every month. 3.2 million children are living with the disease. And pediatric coverage continues to lag behind adult treatment coverage in many, many countries. Over the past few years, we've invested time in better understanding how to close this gap and address the challenging last mile of PMTCT. We're also working now in Cameroon, Uganda, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and intend to, spend, to expand to other countries to address these persistent barriers related both to closing the pediatric treatment gap and PMTCT. The new WHO guidelines, <clears throat> which have been quickly adopted by many countries, recognize that all pregnant and breastfeeding women, as well as children under five, should receive lifelong ARTs. To meet this target, we'll have to help developing countries focus on a number of very specific priorities over the next three to five years. First, we have to drastically reduce transmission among, excuse me, during the breastfeeding period. This is proving to be, I must say, a real challenge. We're getting better at reaching women during pregnancy, but once they deliver a healthy baby, many simply don't come back. As many as 50% of all new pediatric infections occur during the breastfeeding period. So keeping these women in care until the end of breastfeeding is perhaps the single most important thing we can do to achieve an AIDS-free generation. It's our big remaining barrier. Second, we have to test all exposed infants and link any HIV-positive baby to immediate life-saving treatment. That's why Basil's still here. Third, we must identify and treat children who were infected over the past decade. They have fallen through the cracks. We all have a responsibility to make sure they receive the care that will allow them to live the full, rich lives they deserve. Last week, during a trip I took to visit our foundation programs in the Asia Pacific, I went to the Bavai Orphanage in Vietnam to meet with HIV-positive children who are receiving both HIV medicines 
and preventive tuberculosis treatment. We've been supporting this orphanage since 2006. It's a real microcosm of the tremendous progress Vietnam has made in strengthening HIV and TB care and increasing capacity across the country. The results from the two years of IPT implementation in Ho Chi Minh City showed patients who received both HIV treatment and IPD had a 97% reduction in TB incidence. Very important in the nation with the 12th highest incidence of tuberculosis in the world. To meet the WHO guidelines and achieve the UN AIDS 90 goals, we're going to have to raise all the money we can, and we're going to have to spend what we have as efficiently as possible. Scale up to date has been driven by an enormous increase in resources, from $5 billion in 2003 to $19.1 billion in 2013. Recent estimates suggest, hopefully, that domestic resources devoted to this are increasing, but not so hopefully. The growth in international donor spending is slowing. We will be forced, regardless, to be more efficient and innovative. We know treatment is affordable. A few years ago, Chai conducted a study in Ethiopia, Malawi, Rwanda, South Africa, and Zambia showing the cost of treatment to be just under $200 per patient per year in low- and lower-middle-income countries. At the time, many people thought it was about $1,000 a year. So the study gave donor governments the confidence they needed to know that treatment scale-up was affordable. It also gave host governments the confidence they needed to do it. We need a similar confidence builder on the cost of scaling up to reach the WHO guidelines. We can't afford to meet them, and we can't afford not to. Pregnant mothers we fail to initiate on treatment will give birth to more HIV-positive infants. Children we don't diagnose will fall through the cracks and end up in hospital wards in developing countries all around the world. Adults who are told they aren't sick enough to receive treatment will become discouraged and end up being lost from the system until it's too late. We cannot let this happen. Our latest analysis on the global cost of the HIV epidemic suggests we simply don't have to. We can achieve the promise of the new WHO guidelines within the existing funding envelope if we found ways to use our resources more effectively. For example, in Zambia, Chai supported the scale-up of community health workers to increase access to medicines and quality of care. The government created a whole new cadre of paid community workers to serve the most remote rural communities where no services at all were previously available. We're also providing training to traditional midwives in Liberia to help convince them to have more women deliver at facilities rather than at home. As a part of Liberia's comprehensive plan, to improve overall maternal, newborn, and child health services, and to decrease one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the world. Rwanda's Ministry of Health offers perhaps the most remarkable example of achieving efficiencies in aid through government leadership. And I want to thank the immediate past head of the U.S. PEPFAR program, Dr. Eric Goolsby, who's out here in the front row, for helping to make this possible. Four years after the genocide, when I visited Rwanda in 2000, excuse me, <clears throat> in 1998, their per capita income was less than $250 a year. They have made remarkable progress, but they're still not a rich country. They have an astonishing goal of being completely free of foreign assistance by 2020. To get there, they've asked the international development community to help them establish a world-class health system that they can afford to operate with people trained to do the job. 
They ask us to help. And with the support of 25 U.S. medical institutions and literally hundreds of faculty members donating their time, they're helping Rwandans to train their entire health workforce. And doing so at a breathtakingly reduced cost. Conventionally, development contractors, at least from our country, charge 35% of general overhead in addition to administrative fees of about 15%. In other words, about half the budget never makes it to the recipient countries. In this program, these universities are operating with zero overhead and only 7% administrative fees. That means $75 million in savings over five years to the Rwandans that will now go to train people who will actually keep people with HIV and AIDS alive. It is a great story, and I'm very proud of everyone involved in it. <clears throat> this kind of capacity building, sharing best practices, and the development of super efficient systems can help us achieve the 90-90-90 goals. As we move toward them, we also need to redouble our efforts to combat stigma and prejudice, which unbelievably, after all these years, is actually on the rise in some places. In 2012, at our annual Clinton Global Initiative, the Global Citizen Awards were given to the Right Reverend Christopher Sinyanjo and Pepe Julian Onzima for their courageous advocacy work in Uganda to protect the rights of LGBTQ citizens. They were warmly received and richly supported. But they were acutely aware that they were being honored because of conditions that should no longer exist. Therefore, in Uganda, Nigeria, and everywhere else, this continues to be a problem. We have to find more Christophers and more Pepes. We have to find more people to hold up and support and empower. We have to remind people <clears throat> that the people we lost on that airplane gave their entire lives to the proposition that our common humanity matters a hell of a lot more than our interesting differences. So here we are at the 20th anniversary with the tools we need to treat HIV and AIDS to stop its transmission to new patients. The AIDS-free world that so many of you have worked for so long to build is just over the horizon. And we just have to step up the pace. Thank you for all you've done and will do.